let's talk a little bit more specifically about the single sign-on flow, since that's what we're really discussing today. So when we talk about single sign-on, what's really happening is the user is going to make an unauthenticated request into PeopleSoft. So we know that going back to our architecture, we know and see that because we understand being inside the PeopleSoft web server, whether that's an authenticated request or not. We know we can see the PS token, for example, so we know that's there. Um, so when we talk about being able to leverage that or access that we can see it and we know whether or not this person is already authenticated. So what happens from a flow perspective is they can go ahead and make the request into PeopleSoft. What's going to happen is we're going to see that it's an unauthenticated request. So we're going to go ahead and redirect them over to the identity provider. It could be any SAML provider, ADFS, Shibboleth. What we're going to do is allow the IDP to provide that challenge for that user. So it's going to go ahead and issue that authentication request. Once the user passes the authentication request, what, what they send back to us is a user ID mapping. Frequently, it's the name ID field. doesn't have to be, but it seems to be pretty common, and that's the one we get. Um, once we get that back, we're going to evaluate it. We're going to look at it, and what ends up happening is the end user ends up with an authenticated session with their normal roles and permission lists as if they had signed into PeopleSoft directly. All of this happens very quickly and really without the user having any knowledge of the steps they're having to go through. So let's jump into demo of this. I'm going to reconfigure my screens just a little bit. Go ahead and get this out of the way. And I'm going to open up a Chrome session. So let's go ahead. What we've, what we've got here is we've got several different options of how we can show the single sign-on at work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with signing into our Office 365 environment first. I'm going to do that with a very low privilege style account inside of PeopleSoft. And what we're going to do is we authenticate into Office 365 first in this scenario. And by doing that, it's going to drop me into a SharePoint site inside of Office. What, this SharePoint site has, has tiles that I have built that actually allow me to jump into the PeopleSoft system without having to pass authentication again. So if I were to click the personal details link here, for example, you can see that I get into the PeopleSoft system without having to authenticate at all um, because I've already gone through that. What we did is the system is configured to um, work with the ADFS system that I just authenticated to. So it just bounced me in and accessing PeopleSoft. It checked with ADFS to see if I had authenticated. I already had, and it did the user ID mapping to allow me in as Vicky's in into the application. You can see our data loss prevention um, technology also comes into play here regardless of how you authenticate into the application. So the social security number has been masked out. Once again, that occurs at a rules engine, so there's no modification to the page. Um, I'm going to go back to the uh, ADFS site here real quick. I'm actually going to drive into Outlook. The reason I want to do this, frequently many of the implementations we deal with, uh, the customers work with workflows or approvals and PeopleSoft sends out emails with deep embedded links into the applications and you want your users to be able to access those very quickly and efficiently. So um, if you open up an email that maybe a user has received with, a, with one of those deep embedded links into PeopleSoft, once again, they've already authenticated to ADFS at this point. So I can go ahead and I can drive into that application or that transaction set. Here's one of them that we're dealing with with the direct deposit. This is where we have layered in our technologies of not only data masking, but multi-factor authentication. You can see from a very streamlined user uh, usability perspective that the user hasn't had to pass 2FA yet, but if they want to access the account number, they need to go through the 2FA validation. So I'm going to go ahead and do an unlock. I've got this demo system configured with Duo. So this is the Duo dialog. I'm going to do a push notification, and you'll see it come up on my phone on the left-hand side. And then I can either approve or deny that via the Duo um, phone app. I'm going to go ahead and do it approve. And what you're going to see is it contextually brings me right back to the page. I've got access to the account number. So very targeted, streamlined, multi-factor 
dealing with the issues or securing the information that definitely needs to be secured inside of the application. The users really understand why they're having to go through that stepped up off because it's very targeted to the situation that they're dealing with. So it's a very sensitive transaction of, of updating your direct deposit information. So that's definitely one of the situations where we see a lot of the multi-factor. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign out here real quick again. And what I wanna do is I wanna come into the application a completely different way. I'm going to go ahead and open Chrome back up. And what I want to do is access the PeopleSoft content first. So I'm going to go into the HRM and I'm going to make a request for the additional information page. I'm going to sign in as PS1, which is a different user than Vicky's in. And I dropped in as Becky, Becky, Betty Lockerty, sorry. Once you can see again is the social security number is still masked and, and redacted. So the nice part about that is that is the rules engine so it's going to apply regardless of who the user is in this situation because of the rule. Maybe I have that um, delimited by uh, conditions based upon maybe who the user is or the roles that they have. Maybe I allow them to access that information. But that's one of the situations that we've you know dealt with. So when we also talk about um, you know this situation, I hadn't passed authentication to the identity provider first. So I basically requested PeopleSoft transactions, got pushed over to the IDP had to pass authentication there, and then I came back to the PeopleSoft system. So it was a little bit different flow from the perspective of how it worked versus the first one. So I'm going to go ahead and do a sign out, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to access the PeopleSoft sign-in dialog. And I'm going to come in as the same user, PS1, and what you're going to see is it allows me to log in directly via that way as well. The nice part about this is, you know, all of these transactions or all of the authentications were directly against the same PeopleSoft system. They weren't against different PeopleSoft systems. They're all configured to work with um, the single sign-on, and we can set in the rules to allow us to work within multiple different um, situations and all that kind of stuff. So one of the things that I wanted to do real quick is jump in and kind of show you um, some of the other, just a, a quick snippet of some of the other, ah, hit the wrong menu button, some of the other data loss prevention that we do, um, just from a high privileged user access, since this is a high privileged user, I'm gonna go ahead and open up somebody's record and what you're going to be able to see is we've got a completely masked social security number on this back end, but it's a click to view. So if the user needs to have access to that data, they can actually see it. Um, once again, you know, very streamlined, very efficient, and there's no modifications to the page to be able to do that. So let's go ahead and jump over and look at our rules engine as a whole to be able to understand how this works inside the system. Um, so I'm going to drive over to our menu structure and I'm going to open up the firewall, configure firewall behavior, and I'm going to open up the rule set. So when we talk about the ADFS challenge rule, for example, one of the things that we're going to start with is we're going to start with the fact of um, it, this is how the rules engine works. So to quickly give you a, 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 a kind of a streamlined um, understanding of the rules it's very you know streamlined from the effect of it's really conditions and actions when the conditions are true and that means all of the conditions so if there's multiple conditions inside of the rule like in this situation there's two of them both of those conditions have to be true before the action down below is going to fire so the two conditions we have for the adfs challenge is number one the user is not logged in they don't have a valid PS token. You know, We don't need to hand them off to authentication if they've already authenticated to the application, if that makes sense. So that's definitely one of the conditions that we want to look at. The other one is that they are not coming from the PeopleSoft login page, that login request page. So that allows us to understand you know, and, and allow different users to access different ways. So maybe if you've got your PeopleSoft administrators who aren't configured inside of your identity provider, they can still access the same PeopleSoft system as everybody else without having to use single sign-on. And because of the rest of the rules engine, we can still apply 2FA and data masking to those accounts regardless of how they authenticate. When we get into the action, 
so the two conditions are true um, when we get into the action and definition and how this works the action is defined as a saml adfs authentication so if you hit the drop down list you can see many of the different action types that we have select the saml adfs and then you select a provider id and this provider id really is just a profile um, if I go ahead and click the, the search inside the PeopleSoft page, what you're going to see is I've got numerous profiles configured here, um, but the one that I'm actively using in this rule for this action is the ADFSB. So let's pivot over to look at how that profile is configured and what it does inside the system. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit search. Here's that same list. I'm going to open up ADFSB. And here's where you're going to see how this is configured. So the top two fields really is setting up the, you know, the PeopleSoft profile name and a way to search for it. When we look at the SAML type of version, what we're doing here is you're setting the protocol that you're going to use to be able to communicate with the identity provider. If you're using ADFS, for example, you, you most likely want to use the ADFS 3.0. Um, and if you're using SAML, you, you would definitely want to use the 2.0 now rather than the 1.1 protocol. But you can um, pick which ones that you want to use to, to implement from that perspective. Um, you know, it, it is up to up to you to set on the profile. Um, the next main section that we see here is the URLs. From the URL, what we're doing there is we're defining this application, the PeopleSoft application with the first one. We're naming this. So the, the, the name that I have given this PeopleSoft system is hrm.devgh.com. So what I'm doing is I need to register that inside the ADFS systems. So there's about five or six lines of, of XML that needs to be loaded into ADFS. And when that, once that gets loaded in, it allows this PeopleSoft system to become a subscribing system, to communicate with that identity provider, for example. Now, so there is a little bit of setup that needs to be done on the identity provider. And then we have the authentication URL and the SAML logout. You know, all that is is configuring where to go for login and where to go for log out. Um, you know, so it's a very streamlined configuration from that perspective. And then down below from a validation point, I would definitely recommend a check signature in a production implementation where you've got a certificate code down here verifying that it's coming from the, the correct provider um, and it's a signed cert, those type of situations. So. Um, we've also got the user mapping. As I said, frequently it's the name ID that, that gets passed from the SAML or um, ADFS provider back to us. Seems to be a frequent implementation, but the nice part about it is we can configure that or set it up multiple different ways. It's very easy. We can look it up. It can be passed to us. We can take you know a value and go look it up in PeopleSoft. Um, so it's very streamlined, very efficient. There's not a lot of, you know, there isn't any coding that you have to do. All that's handled via the profile, via the setup and the configuration of it. So it, it's very easy to maintain and, and work with. Um, the other nice part about it is when you talk about having multiple providers, uh, we've got some of our customers who have as many as five different single sign-on providers within the same PeopleSoft system. So depending upon maybe who the institution is or who the user is, they may need to use a specific single sign-on provider that we need to you know pass that user over to so um, you can configure multiple different identity providers very easily inside of the system and since they're really it gets applied via the rules engine that's the way we apply it it's the way it's built um, it becomes very streamlined very efficient as to how those users are working with it so from a maintenance perspective very easy to implement um, doesn't take a lot of overhead uh, really good performance from that perspective, but it's very easy and you don't have to spend a lot of time maintaining additional web servers, for example, or putting additional hops in the way to try to communicate with the identity provider. You can have that integration built very tightly with the PeopleSoft system and your single sign-on provider to where they communicate and pass some of those inf pieces of information back and forth. One of the other things that we've done with um, tying into the IDP is inside of our general rules engine, when you take it a little bit past just single sign-on, for example, we allow you to look at SAML or ADFS claims and then apply 
those to the, the PeopleSoft system, for example. So maybe you're looking for somebody accessing with a certain email address or a certain domain, or maybe you're looking for a flag that says apply to factor or apply data masking. Once you see those, you can grab them and you can use them as um, conditions built inside of those rules. So, you know, it's very, it allows you to extend the security and pull in additional information from your identity provider to then make decisions maybe based inside your PeopleSoft system as to maybe who the user is or, or what the value of a, of a particular setting is inside of, of your identity provider. So, very streamlined, very efficient um, integration allows you, you know, to spend less time maintaining it. You don't have to implement additional servers and allows you to, you know, get up and running very, very quickly from the integration standpoint.